Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we have um, a good amount of material to cover today that is of uh, very different types. So first, we will want to cover uh, what we left out of last lecture. So the last lecture, we didn't have time to cover this final problem of the day, but you have all had now plenty of time to think about what might be going on here. This is the problem of the day number five is the famous Tisler uh, triazolo pyridine synthesis that it can be used to make pyrimidines as well as you see here. So in problem of the day number five, we're just going to take this intermediate and all we're going to do is heat it up. So uh, anyone want to offer, since you've had uh, overnight to think about it, uh, a possible suggestion on where we might go first in terms of moving arrows here. Do you just get attack of your primary mean onto the carbonate carbon? And uh, that sounds like a good idea. All right, now we have this interesting creature. So uh, what do you suspect we could do with that? So you need to form your NN bond. So I think you can get attack onto the secondary amine and then imagine expelling CO2. which after tautomerization would uh, just give us our, uh, well, it wouldn't give us that product, but it would rather give us the compound with NH2 there, which we could then easily put on the sulfonamide. Now, you might also imagine that um, a possible mechanism for this would go via the intermediacy of simply a nitrine. And uh, the reason that this mechanism, although logical, when you heat it up, you might imagine something like that can form, certainly reasonable. The reason that uh, people prefer not to invoke it for the Tisler is that you can actually isolate that kind of intermediate and then separately uh, treat it. But you could still imagine that maybe there's a nitrine going on. So if you had that alternative mechanism in mind, it definitely wouldn't be bad. Okay, and then the final problem of the day from yesterday uh, is this one. And uh, we need to make some key disconnections. We've got ring A, B here. We wanna do a med chem campaign. So we'd like to really keep this constant and we really wanna change these two substituents in a library format. So if one is going to do that, it probably would mean that we could look at this piece here as potentially being derived from an aldehyde. And you can imagine that piece on the bottom potentially being derived from um, some sort of halide through SNAR or buckwell hartwig And that leaves us with the question of how to put that fragment in in a convenient fashion. Is uh, there a disconnection we could use for an electron-rich heteroaromatic that might be useful for installing a, a formaldehyde fragment? Bosmeyer. That sounds good. That leaves us back to a much simpler compound that looks like this. And now we have to come up with a quick way of putting that together. Now we've got to address this AB problem. And I think what, what is probably very clear at this moment is that um, taking ring B and annulating on A is probably not in your best interest. 
because that's going to be a very complicated imidazole uh, cyclization that you, you need to get to go. Um, so that's probably not very strategic. But instead, as we learned over and over again yesterday, you can look at this as simply an imidazole. And if it was an imidazole, the way you would make it would be to simply take the corresponding amidine, which is a two amino pyridine hiding. And the equivalent you need for this can be achieved using this very cheap reagent. A 1,1,3 acetone uh, trichloro compound, which will alkylate at that position, condense at that position, and through the gramine-like intermediate we covered in maybe lecture one or two, you can imagine upon aqueous workup, that dichloro is not going to be sticking around for a long time and will give you the aldehyde right away. Do your reductive amination, do your Vilsmeyer hack formulation, do your SMAR, and you now have a million analogs. Great. Well, that concludes yesterday's lecture. So now we can move on to lecture 18 on benzodiazepines. And benzodiazepines are worthy of their own separate lecture because they're number one, um, the first probably many medicinal chemists regard it as the first example of a privileged architecture in medicinal chemistry. Um, the number of drugs that are out there and clinical candidates that are out there based on the benzodiazepine is enormous. And the number of indications that benzodiazepines can be used for is also quite vast, ranging anywhere from you know, neuroscience to oncology. And um, it also points to a very important inflection point in the pharmaceutical industry in that benzodiazepines, one could argue, were the first blockbuster drugs. So that's why it's kind of important to cover them. Uh, the other reason is it's a great segue into tomorrow's all new lecture on saturated heterocycles, because as you'll notice, these are not heteroaromatic compounds. So some, in some cases they may be, but in the case of something like Valium you see below, of course, that's not an aromatic compound. So um, it's a, uh, a great segue to tomorrow when we're gonna cover all the saturated ring systems that might be important to you. So let's talk about benzodiazepines and their storied history. And the storied history of the benzodiazepines really centers on one particular individual um, that they wrote a book about. So Leo Sternbach is the person you should probably remember uh, as the inventor of the, you know, not only Valium, but the, I would say pointed everyone to the fact that benzodiazepines are very, very useful structures. Here he is on his 80th birthday. Uh, he was the, um, a chemist chemist. So he loved more than anything else, not politics, not management, but rather just doing great chemistry. And um, I met him many years ago, uh, a super down to earth, uh, re really kind individual, had lunch with him, um, very, very modest and humble and came from very humble upbringing. So he escaped Nazi Germany, uh, and landed in uh, New Jersey where he began um, the second part of his career uh, working at, um, at Roche. And uh, during that period, it was a period where they were seeking compounds that might have sedative effects. And you remember from the great guest lecture we had from Carolyn Zerba from BMS, neuroscience is of course a difficult area for pharma to be in because the biological assays simply are not that great. And uh, that's why, as she discussed, many ph large pharma have de uh, departed from the air area simply because throwing mice in a bucket of milk and putting them in a hot plate is a, a very a sort of crude way of evaluating bioactivity. But that's what they had back during the era of uh, benzodiazepine discovery. And so his job was to figure out if they could find any kind of sedative or pain relieving types of compounds. And the approach was very empirical and very much based upon chemical instinct. And um, for some reason, uh, Sternbach was drawn to these very interesting structures that were reported in the early German literature called the heptox diazine, very interesting looking structures and made many of these types of compounds. And uh, some of them were nice crystals and submitted many of them to biological evaluation. And none of them really had any activity at all. And this went on for quite a while. And as you can imagine, his supervisor 
from the director at the time began to become increasingly impatient with what seemed to be a research project rather than a drug discovery program and told them basically, you know, it's really time to wrap this story up and uh, clean up your bench and let's start with something totally new. But um, before he did that, um, you know, he found something very interesting, which is that uh, there is some issue with the structure of a heptox diazine. Namely, number one, when you took these structures and you treated them with palladium on carbon, they very, very rapidly would lose one oxygen atom. And that's not something you would expect from a compound like this. I mean, one could imagine that upon prolonged treatment, maybe you would break the NO bond, but why would you just lose one oxygen atom? So he became, to be, he became increasingly suspicious that the structure of these compounds was not actually what they seemed to be. In fact, when he treated this compound here uh, with R equal to methyl or phenyl with the so-called Beckman mixture, acetic anhydride and acetic acid, HCl, he found that in fact, the heptoxidiazine that was originally proposed was not actually uh, the correct structure. So let's think for a moment about uh, what it might actually be. What might be the first step when you treat this with excess acetic anhydride and acetic acid? What might you get from that? Just basic organic chemistry. You isolate the amine and probably also the oxygen. Fantastic. And then we need some sort of cyclization event to take place. It doesn't form the heptoxidiazine, but it forms something else. Um, any ideas on what might happen if it is not doing that? Can you form the anoxide if you cyclize from the oxygen nitrogen? Um... That's a great idea. So if you're activating this amide, you can imagine this gets activated and this one swings around and attacks then you might imagine that the actual product from such a reaction might look something more like this. A quinazoline anoxide. So that is the product they were actually making the entire time. And he decided that um, if they were making at the time, they didn't really know whether they were making it or not, but if they were making heptoxidiazines, instead of using acetic anhydride, what if they used uh, the chloroacetic anhydride? That would give them the structure you see here. And so this was a great little analog program for them because it allowed them to take these intermediates add in a bunch of secondary amines to give them the corresponding amine derivatives. And they tested all of these compounds and found that they had absolutely no bioactivity. However, when they started treating these compounds, which are actually not these structures and not this structure, when they started treating these with primary product they got was that. Any ideas how that might form? Could you get addition into the imine and then a shift? That's fantastic. So instead of addition to here, we can imagine addition right over here and then a shift. And that gives us a compound called Librium. And um, when Librium was first tested in mice, uh, Sternbach got a feverish and enthusiastic call from the pharmacologist informing him that whatever he had, make more of it because it's the best thing they've ever seen. And so that became, they began the uh, sort of the quest of the benzodiazepines and it led to and numerable uh, medicines. So Librium is an example. Serax is an example. Let's see, how do we convert Librium into Serax? Let's take a look at the structures. Here is Serax. So we need a way of converting Librium into Serax. 
How might we do that? Let's go back to the original blank notes here. Any idea on how we might convert Librium into Cerex, meaning we want to convert that to an auction and we need now an OH here. Any idea based on what we've learned before? Can you do a vocal hide? Yeah, vocal hide type reaction will give you your OH and the HCL treatment will cleave your amidine to your amide. And now you've got Cerex. Um, and if you just treat this with H plus, you'll get out this compound. And if you take this compound and reduce it down, we know that N oxide is readily cleaved, you'll get Valium. So Roche began a series of analogs that led to the golden goose for the company. And these compounds all became incredibly powerful sedatives. And to this day, there are still many benzodiazepines uh, on the market for a variety of indications in, in neuroscience. Uh, I think one sort of little funny story that pertains to San Diego, you can see here, uh, in one famous sub study, Librium was tested on leopards, lions, and tigers right here in the San Diego Zoo. And um, the big, cat, big cats, they say, were successfully subdued. And uh, one newspaper headline asked, the drug that tames tigers, what will it do for nervous women? Uh, it was a different era, but still funny. Um, so they never did market this drug in, um, as a sedative for the uh, the tigers and the lions, but uh, as you can imagine, it did become a hit in households uh, around the world. So many of you may know, uh, have grandparents who can talk about the, 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 all the rage of this compound and many people became as a consequence addicted to uh, benzodiazepines. They are, of course can be quite useful, but the problem with them of course, as some of you may know, is that they have to be, uh, if you are on them for a long time and you stop, you need to do it gradually because it can have quite a, a, a bad impact if you just abruptly end them. So fast forward many, many years, uh, we now know how to make benzodiazepines in far better ways than going through ring expansions of uh, quinazolines. So the better ways of doing this are obviously using rather simple common sense condensation chemistry where you make an amide bond here and then you can imagine cyclizing here and condensing, or you can also imagine uh, doing the uh, imine formation here and having that attack to the alpha halo ketone. So kind of common sense ways of making these. Um, in the case of olanzapine, we covered this, uh, I think at a very early stage, but the sort of uh, curveball I wanna throw to you folks, presumably our radio labeling friends will know this best. Maybe Tim can help us with a strategy that would uh, put together olanzapine uh, very quickly. Now we learned how to make a piece of olanzapine. I think it was all the way back in lecture four or three, I'm forgetting, uh, but we already learned how to make olanzapine. We learned the intermediate. Um, and so all I need here is your so sort of thoughts on how one might be able to make that radio labeled compound with a C14 at that starred carbon. Yeah, sure. So my thought would be to take um, like a, a a dichloroaldehyde radio labeled or formaldehyde or even a carboxylic acid and then do um, a carboxylate at the nitrogen um, so that you get that radio label there and then just do condensation with the nitrogen. So you're saying you would like to start from something like let me see if I get this right. What do you want to put on the thiophene? So I'm getting it right. What's here? Mm. Um, is that your idea? It was, but now that it's drawn out, it is no longer my idea. Um, just because that looks kind of unstable. But I mean, I guess I guess it could be a halogen. Okay. Now, how are you going to put in that? Where's the radio label carbon coming? You said carboxylation. Yeah, I was thinking to do it on the, the piperidine. Piperidine. Uh, well, the sorry, the the I the saturated um, dinitrogen. I, I forget what that's called. Oh, yeah, the piperidine. I see what you're saying. Well, you're, you're very this key disconnection is, is, is really what you want to be thinking. You know, you, you're definitely on the right track. The key here is, as we learned in that original lecture, the way to make a lanzapine is via an intermediate like this. This intermediate comes from, just to recap from that old lecture, 
is from this plus the corresponding thiophene. And then and you have your nitro. Uh, you can reduce that down. It then cyclizes, as we, uh, you may remember. To give a compound that looks like that. And do you remember this? When you take this compound and you boil it up with piperazine, piperidine, uh, that will do a exchange with ammonia. So all we need is our radio labeled nitrile. And uh, as Tim said, we can, of course, get that from the corresponding bromide. Where does that bromide come from? Well, we don't want to do NBS on an aminothiophene. That may not be so stable. But we know we can use Faisalman or, or Gowald, potentially, to give us um, a ester here. So just like we did with the synthesis of uh, labeled and Les call back in lecture number five, I think, uh, you can do a Hunsdeker to put a bromo there, use radio labeled KCN or copper cyanide, whatever your favorite cyanide sources with C14, close it up and do the last two steps in the same way. So this allows one to intercept an intermediate from the process chemistry side and then degrade it, reconstitute it with the radio label carbon, and then close it and use the exact same route that we talked about early on. And uh, just a reminder, uh, we, I snuck in Xanax in the form of uh, triazolo benzodiazepine, I think it was uh, yesterday, and Sung Han already gave us the answer of how to make that. I just include Xanax because there's a lot of people who take this stuff. Uh, it's, I think, a billion dollar drug, or at least at one point was. It might have gone generic by now. Uh, but this compound can be made in the way that Sung Han described to us yesterday, wherein you can see that this is a, a mitrazone hiding right here. Okay, let's move on to problem of the day number one. We need a good way of making this from a sort of medchem standpoint, and then we're going to talk about how process might have put this together. So from a medchem standpoint, I guess the first thing we can do is let's just delete this group here and just think about that as coming from some sort of Friedel crafts. Or uh, for now, let's just delete that group and we have this core. So all we have to think about is this core compound. And um, so we need some uh, thought on how we might be able to put this together quickly from a medchem standpoint. What, uh, what do you think is, would be a logical way to go here? Uh, maybe Brendan can help us out. Um, so I'm thinking the, the amide bond would be uh, something you could cut. Okay. Well, let's see. So, uh, and if I cut that bond, let's see. I should probably leave the other fragment in there. Is that what you want? I guess you could do something okay. like that. Great. Now, how do I make that? Um, you could just do um, just uh, emanation of the corresponding arrow halide to do your whatever reaction you want to do there. Cool. OK. Uh, it comes from a simple aspartate derivative. And uh, add it in, almond, buckwall, whatever you want. And uh, then reductive emanation, and it should just snap shut. That's great. Of course, for medchem, that might work fine, but one needs to potentially worry about um, a couple of things. One is the epimerization that might occur at that site when you do the uh, almond or buckwall, whatever reaction. And then the other thing you might have to worry about on process scale is maybe you might want to avoid any kind of uh, pre-functionalized materials that require transition metal cross coupling. So the process chemist decided to take a very different look at this problem and rationalize that maybe you could make it through a hydrogenation. So we're going to install that stereocenter through a hydrogenation. And in general, you're going to see in process chemistry that three main ways, as I might have mentioned before, of installing asymmetry are going to be through either asymmetric hydrogenation, biocatalysis, or resolution. And so if they identify a disconnection that is amenable to hydrogenation, 
they will run on it quickly. And uh, then we need a good way of making this compound, which you can imagine could come as a consequence of simply starting with this very cheap aldehyde. There is the key carbon and there is the key nitrogen, which are both expressed in these simple starting materials. So how do we move forward with this compound? Well, one can first do the reductive amination. And then two, react with that dialkyl. And the product of that is this. And when one treats this with sodium methoxide, out pops this. How do you like that? That's exactly what we need, <clears throat> isn't it? Now, all we do is hydrogen and we're done. How did this happen? Well, uh, you can imagine that this undergoes some sort of uh, ring opening, followed by ring closing, and that gets you to your ring expanded product. They did all of these steps, starting from here, everything in one pot, telescoped all the way to the final product uh, after hydrogenation. And they did this on multi-kilogram scale. So pretty, pretty uh, glorious achievement here by this process team. Okay, great. Let's move on to these ones, Brito benzodiazepines. As I mentioned before, uh, this class should be far more simple than all the other ones we've had. So Brito benzodiazepine, this looks like it's gonna be a two second retrosynthesis. Um, anyone wanna just, call out what might be the way to make this quickly? We're going to break the B ring. We're going to break the B ring. And so now Sung Han is going to tell me what substituents I should have at the one and two position of the pyridine. Uh, I guess you can have a nitro on two position and a living group on one position. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Done. Great, let's move on to this one and uh, we'll up the ante a little bit in that uh, we're gonna put here a labeled carbon. Labeled carbon at the start position. Um, so let's see, I don't know if uh, Jun Chen is around. Maybe he can help us with this one. Yes, yeah, so, so you can start from diketone. Oh, you just broke it straight. Oh, wait, wait. You just broke it straight away to the diketone. That's interesting. Okay. Let me let me catch up to you, Jun Chen. One second. All right. How do I make that? So you can use S. Uh, wait. Uh, can we do S and A R here? Maybe not. So we have a choice. We can either break that bond or we can break that bond, red or green. Yeah, I finally I will break the bond. I don't, but I don't know which, which bond to break first. Well, I, I've uh, labeled them in a suggestive fashion, like a traffic light. Um, and, and- Oh, okay. The green, green one. So yeah, maybe the green one is good because we can take advantage of Friedel Crafts chemistry. And the other nice thing about this is remember, Jun Chen, we are doing radio labeling. So I don't want to make a compound like this. And I think we have our radio labeling lecture next week. I don't want to make a compound like this with a radio label carbon because now I have to go back steps and make this even longer. I want to have the minimum number of steps possible that have any hot material, as we, as we mentioned. So this is great because we can take all the time we want to make this one. It's all cold. As soon as we introduce this through the Frito Crafts, it's hot. So we're going to very quickly treat this um, 
under Friedel Crafts conditions, that will give us the equivalent of the diketone. It's not a diketone, but rather a heterocycle, which you probably expected you would never see again. but it's back, the perillium. But uh, Jun Chen didn't need to say perillium. Uh, the 1,4 uh, or 1,5 dicarbonyl was enough. But in practice, you'll get the perillium, which is operationally the same as Jun Chen's diketone, which when you treat that with hydrazine gives you your labeled material. Fantastic. Questions? Okay. So let's move on to this compound. Now another radial label. So is there a quick and dirty way of making this one? And one might say, hey, Phil, I looked at the benzodiazepine retrosynthesis problem, uh, strategy square above, and the obvious disconnection to me is this one. Now, if this was a cold problem and not a hot one, this would be uh, certainly a fine disconnection, but it's a hot problem. So we have to handle each sequence of the radio labeled um, synthesis with like holding you know, a hot potato. So we don't wanna be doing it for very long. So we need another disconnection, wherein this labeled carbon is brought in at the latest stage possible. And how could we do that? If you excise it, you have the primary amine. And could you just do labeled acetic acid or labeled carboxylic acid, like a methyl carboxylic acid? And all you need here is just labeled acetic acid, which should be good. So that's fantastic. Now, how do we make that? We learned from Sung Han yesterday how we can take amides and get them primed for addition. So we already know that we can make this starting with a benzodiazepine of the type that Leo Sternbach would love. And we can activate that amide in whatever way you like. You can make the imminoyl chloride, you can make the uh, thiomethyl compound. You can then add into that uh, nitromethane and then reduce it. We have our nice amino methyl compound that Tim has prescribed. Dump in acetyl chloride or acetic acid labeled and we are done. Versus the root above, which require a lengthy synthesis of a radio label compound and a lot of waste involved. All that radio label waste. Great. Well, problem of the day number two. This one is a doozy. We shall spend a long time on this one um, because look at all the cool things we've got in this compound. We've got embedded in here a pyrazole that looks kind of intimidating with that alkylation site, a, benz a benzoxazepine. Wow, there's an aminazole in there and there's a strange triazole. So you kind of need everything we've learned after the midterm to figure this one out. Um, so I'll give you a second to study it, um, and um, we'll be giving out lots of pyridoge here. Let's see if there are some initial disconnections that can help us get started and thinking about uh, how to put this together. Maybe some initial disconnections that might look strategic at one point, some ring systems that look they can, like they can be disconnected in a certain way. Almost anything you tell me I can use. Anyone want to start us off? Let's label these rings. So many heterocycles. Can we do some SNAR to form the C ring onto the B ring? Can we do SNAR to, so you would like to forge uh, this ring system 
by either disconnection here or disconnection here. And that implies that we're also gonna disconnect there, correct? So let's go with one of those possibilities. Let's put an R there. And uh, I should get rid of this because you just disconnected it. And in its wake is going to go, let's say that compound. AR, and then that's R up there. And then we need some good electrophiles. So, you know, that might be fine. That's okay. What might be the potential issue for that disconnection on a large scale? Regioselectivity. Yes, thank you. So we are going to pivot to look at the other disconnection that Tim originally said, which might be more strategic which is maybe we need to put some X here, maybe a fluoro and think about ways that we might be able to do um, SNAR and then cyclize. But still with this one, we have a regiochemical conundrum, but we've got these two options in mind that I want you to just retain and think about. Okay, so these are some good analyses of how we've broken up the benzoxa, uh, benzoxazepine. Great job. There's a lot of heterocycles here. So I want some other uh, strategic thoughts from you folks on other bonds we might be able to break before we put all these pieces together. Let's think about it from the standpoint of the amazing scientists at Genentech that invented this molecule. Uh, the medicinal chemists needed to figure out a way to rapidly interrogate both this part of the molecule and this part of the molecule. So can we think from a medicinal chemistry standpoint, what kind of intermediate would be your dream intermediate to have in such a circumstance? Could you have- Oh, sorry. Go ahead, no. Um, could you have, could you put an ester placeholder for the E-ring and a bromide for the A-ring for cross-coupling? Sounds really great. I love the way you're thinking. Now, when R is equal to an ester, how would you like to put that triazole in, Nor? Stemming from what we talked about mm, a little more than 24 hours ago. Do you see it? Let's recall the Genentech synthesis of triazoles. If you look back in your notes on that, you'll recall that in order to execute on exactly what you're saying, we need an intermediate that basically looks like this. And based on what we learned just yesterday, that should condense to give us our desired triazole, right? And yeah. This, this is of course derived, this right here is derived from the compound with R equal to ester. That's fantastic. However, Noor, you're in medicinal chemistry. How do you know that you wanted that triazole? How did you figure that out so quickly? You don't, <laughs> you just- you don't. So can you give me another R group here that would be maybe more appropriate for a med chem strategy? I guess you could also do cross coupling. How about R equal to I? Yeah. That sounds really good. Where might R equal to I come from? Just NIS, I guess. That would seem logical, wouldn't it? However, in practice, the folks in medicinal chemistry 
were never able to get anything but that. Now, uh, you, Noor, as a uh, veteran of heterocyclic chemistry, uh, look at this problem and say, that's not an issue at all. Because why? Is there a sneaky way you know from lecture number three that would easily allow you to access the mono iodo from the di iodo? Yeah, I could do a lithium halogen exchange and it would preferentially go for the one at the two position. I don't know how you'd number that, but. Brilliant. Yeah. That's awesome. So lithium halogen exchange takes place instantaneously. That iodide goes faster than anything else. And like lightning, it's gone. Now we need a way of making uh, the corresponding imidazole. And in order to make that imidazole, we can take advantage of exactly what Tim taught us way up here, uh, except we are gonna have no AR, we're just gonna have the imidazole. So in order to take advantage of what Tim said, now we don't have any regiochemical quagmire at all. We can imagine this comes from this compound. And now Tim or someone need you to dig real deep into uh, the lecture on imidazole, go back to the oldest example of making an imidazole, what would my precursor be? Anybody remember? It's the very first imidazole synthesis that anyone ever came up with. Could you have a uh, LD high? Yes, brilliant. And then we're gonna treat this with dibromoethane and we get our nice product out. We do our diatonation. We do Noor's trick to remove one of the Ido compounds. And then we can do Nagishi all day. The Nagishi to install the triazole in this case. As you can imagine, they made tons and tons of analogs. And they found that uh, this was the key candidate that eventually became a drug by using this zincated species. And um, happily, we know how to make this compound very quickly, don't we? We can see right here, right there is hiding trimethyl orthoformate, isn't it? So look how fast we stitch this together. All you need now is if we can make this a mitrazone and then react it with trimethyl orthoformate, we'll get the product. And this goes back to, I don't know, lecture one. How do you make that? Well, that just looks like uh, acetonitrile <laughs> plus the hydrazine. And then deprotonation. There's only one site left to de CH deprotonate. That triazole is quite activated for deprotonation. So you deprotonate, you make your zincated species, you couple with Nagishi, you get your uh, lead candidate, and you're good to go. Now, obviously this is phenomenal for medicinal chemistry, but the process chemists probably look at this and they say, well, it's not gonna be good enough for long-term deliveries. In fact, it was good enough for short-term as we learned uh, in our guest lecture yesterday, it really depends. Can you scale up something like this? They did. They, I think for the first pilot batch, they could use this route from MedChem and get hundreds of grams of compound. But as it became more and more clear that this compound was gonna be an actual FDA approved medicine, and you realize you're gonna need tons of this stuff, you've gotta get even more clever about how you can avoid things like palladium if possible. So let's make our way back up to the big picture and start thinking more about the strategies we see above here. What if we use- uh, the, Yeah, go ahead, the, Nick. The iodination couldn't compete with the benzene? Nope. Because Iodo is you... much faster than the, than the bromo and the benzene. No, no, what I mean is when you treat with the NIS, um, you essentially have to uh, take 
the imidazole and tag that twice. Yep. Uh, so that, uh, and you have an electron donating group on the benzene. So the, the imidazole it, it, is still more electron rich. Well, it's not that electron donating. You've only got that alkoxy, but you've got an electron withdrawn pyridine like nitrogen neighboring the benzene ring, and you've already got a bromine here. So if you do the chem draw trick, you'll find that the imidazole is the one that wins. I see. Okay. okay. Yep. Thanks. So what if we take a mixture of Noor's logic, who very perceptively picked up on the processes connection right away, and we think about Tim's initial suggestion. That gets us back to an intermediate that looks like this. So at the very end of the synthesis, we're going to be stuck to one cross coupling. That's the way they ended up. So we're going to need to do a cross coupling there. But now we have a way of thinking about making this compound that doesn't involve Nagishi coupling, but rather uses what Noor taught us right down here, the Genentech method for making triazoles. Now, how do you make that compound? Well, you can imagine this compound comes from an imidazole synthesis. Look at that. It's just an amidine, just as we talked about over and over again yesterday. There's your amidine hiding. What's your coupling agent? Bromopyruvic acid. That's cheap as chips. Where does this thing come from? Well, you can imagine that this thing comes from finally exactly what Tim wanted at the very beginning. How do you like that? Now, there's an intermediate strategy that they also tried. You can imagine with this compound in hand, you could say to me, hey, Phil, why don't you react that compound with this? It's also a viable disconnection that in this two-part OPRD you can read about, an odyssey exploration of making this very complex heterocycle, they have a nice discussion on how they could, in fact, use this alpha chloroketone as well, which is derived from the same disconnection that we saw before with the corresponding zincate and acylation. So that was examined, but didn't win out in the end. Now, there's one last piece to this puzzle we have to talk about, which is this pyrazole, which so far we have ignored. So I already alluded to the fact that there's going to be a cross coupling at the end. So that means we're going to need a pyrazole that looks like this. And in order to get that uh, pyrazole boronic acid, we probably can do some sort of Muir borrelation. And in order to get that uh, bromo compound, we finally just need treatment of this with NBS. And you can install that through an alkylation from native pyrazole. And before you start jumping up and down complaining, how are you doing an SN2 reaction on a quaternary center? Uh, that system is specialized and presumably goes through some sort of single electron tra transfer pathway, but it's known that you can alkylate things like phenols and other nitrogen heterocycles um, directly just by treating with a weak base. They undergo displacement at that position. So that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, summarizes uh, you know, a campaign that took many, many years and led to a very useful drug for um, anti-cancer therapy. Hey, Phil. Yes. Uh, before we move on, um, I'm, this might be a bit of a stretch, uh, but could you, so going back to the first disconnect we discussed with the regiochemical uh, alkylation quagmire, uh, could you perhaps 
use some sort of like salt bridge or Lewis acid to uh, bind to coordinate to the nitrogens of the D and the E ring and then get selective alkylation. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, yeah, perhaps uh, I see what you're saying. So let's zoom in on Daniel's very uh, creative suggestion, which is to imagine that this could coordinate like that. Is that the idea? And then, and then allow for a selective alkylation at that position rather than going at that position. Is that right, Daniel? Did I translate that correctly? Correct. Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. I think that's something that you know one could uh, definitely you know, consider. It's a, that's the kind of idea that I think they would love to have someone like you working in the company to think of an idea like that. Yeah. I can't say why that's not a good idea. It certainly is a good idea. And that might, that kind of idea would be one that if this was the route they were wedded to and they needed to find a way to get regional control, that is a phenomenal suggestion. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. All this is, all the disconnections I've given you here, they're all good on an exam or in an interview, right? None of these are failed ideas. They're all ones as you'll read it. If you read the OPRD, you'll see they examined all of them. So the point of root scouting, as we saw yesterday, is having all of these options before you. Yeah, great, great idea. And uh, in terms of the regio control, so you presumably have the um, oxygen uh, attacking. So if you go to the right, when you form the, uh, yeah, so when you form the oxidizing, so yeah. uh, the oxygen displaces the fluoride because it's going yes. to the fluid first, right? And then, yes. and then you, okay, well, I see. It, it, you know, if you deprotonate uh, an amino alcohol, it's actually the alcohol that does the attacking. So you'll get SNAR here, but you could imagine the alternative mechanism where instead the nitrogen first attached, attacked at the nitrile and then that resulting amidine alcohol did the intramolecular SNAR. Either way you want to think about it, it's matched. Right, I see, I see, okay, thanks. Yep. Great. Okay, well, uh, this was a pretty complicated one, but I think pretty easy compared to uh, the other ones we've talked about, given that you know all the rules of how to make a compound like this already. So yeah, you all did a great job on that. Let's take a look at this BET inhibitor. Um, and uh, for this one, perhaps it might make sense to get some initial thoughts because we've got, let's see, we've got a thiophene, we have a uh, azepine, and we've got an isoxazole. That, uh, boy, that doesn't look so simple. How can we simplify this thing? You can sort of fish out an aspartate from there. We're going to try to fish out an aspartate. So essentially, you'd start with the A ring with an appended aryl ketone at the three position. And at the, uh, yeah, at this position you'd have, I well, keep my, actually- Keep my ox ice oxazole? What do you want me to do there, Nora? No, so break break up the oxazole, uh, but keep, like keep it as an oxy. Okay. So, so if you deprotonate alpha to the oxime and um, essentially attack the acid of aspartate. And this one. That perhaps? Yeah. That's a pretty cool idea. Um, I think when you start looking for aspartate, we can look for it in a multiple of ways. Um, you know, I, I think that's an awesome idea. And let's riff off of that theme, Nor, of trying to say, um, find the ice oxazole disconnection first which is really the theme of your suggestion. So the other way of thinking about it would be trying to get 
regiochemical control in the addition of hydroxylamine to that compound, correct? Which would again stem from the same intermediate you, start, you thought about. But your suggestion is even better because it presumably would give us complete regiocontrol because you know that this is going to be a more acidic position than that one when you deprotonate. Love it. That's awesome. Really clever. Your pure doge account is going to explode. Nor. All right, let's think of a, an alternative pathway that maybe looks at how we might be able to, um, you know, view this piece here as a bridging element that allows one to piece together the entire ring system. So we can think about this potentially as coming from cross coupling event. And let's see what happens when we do that. That gives us the corresponding amide. And um, so we know we can do a PLCL3, we can do cross couplings all day on that. And uh, then where does this thing come from? Well, you can imagine that this here, this bond is now a strategic one to break. So that gets us back to this. So if you treat this with a simple Wittig reagent and then ammonia, it's going to make the amide, which will then do a heteromichal reaction. And now all we have to do is get this compound, which you can imagine starting from NORS intermediate. Plus. this boronic acid. Now we learned how to make boronic acids like that or isoxazoles with similar patterns yesterday in Mike Schmidt's great lecture. And that involved a three plus two. Which is sort of electronically matched. So that's what they did. But this intermediate is a real great gateway because it will allow you to do what looks to me like a much better disconnection from a process standpoint, which is the one that Noor originally picked up on nearly instantaneously. Great. All right, let's take a look at this interesting compound, uh, which hopefully you can come up with a very fast way to access. In looking at this compound, one thing you can do that sometimes simplifies the picture for you is to add a carbonyl. So if retrosynthetically we add a carbonyl, watch what happens. Now the story becomes a little bit simpler because all you need access to is something like that. Wherein we would make our benzodiazepine core we would do reductive aminations here. We would do reduction of the lactam here. We would do sulfonamide formation here. And now it allows us to start with a library of amino acids. Now, my favorite equivalent of this that I always recommend are intermediates like this that actually have a name. We may have covered this before, I don't remember. Does anybody remember what the name of this thing is? These are isotoic anhydrides, and they're fantastic reagents because they essentially allow you to protect the nitrogen and activate the acid at the same time. And they're available from the corresponding parent anthranilic acid. And that, when you add in your amino acid, adds in dutifully liberating CO2. Subsequently, cyclization of this amine onto the ester gives you the exact compound you need 
bearing that strategically placed carbonyl group that we will later on deoxygenate away. The inclusion of that carboxy group enables the rapid library format access to these benzodiazepines. That makes sense? Could you add the carbonyl at the other methylene? Uh, could you add the carbonyl? Do you mean, does it ever attack here? No, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, in the, where, where, in the structure where you first drew the oh, carbonyl, oh, add oh. it at the other one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So what if you had done that? I mean, couldn't you start from essentially like just the unmodified or un unreduced amino acid? Let's draw your disconnection, uh, Daniel. You mean that, right? Correct. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. The only potential quagmire you might have is the instability of compounds like this because they rapidly will do quinomethide formation. That's one small issue that you, if you can work around that, uh, then you may be good to go on that. Um, but sure, it's also a reasonable disconnection. I think when you look in the literature though, you'll find that uh, handling these types of intermediates is not as fun in the library format. Like if I wanted to make a library of those, I would be very, very worried about whatever my leaving group would be. Bromide, chloride, iodide, tosylate, alcohol with acid, all of them make me worried. And I, if I was doing a hundred analogs a day, I would just prefer to take isotopic and hydrides dump and stir, there's a lot of ways of making isotoric and hydrides from anthranilic acids, tons of anthranilic acids commercially available. You can make them even through CH activation, either from the benzoic acid by emanation or from the amine by carboxylation. So there's a huge gateway to tons and tons of these things. So just from a pragmatic standpoint, this is probably, if you made both of these disconnections, I would probably favor the one on the right for that reason. But if you put this on the bottom one on a test, certainly we couldn't, you know, couldn't take off for that. Okay, great. Well, these ones are kind of a, a small diversion to pay homage to uh, some of the amazing chemistry of um, benzodiazepines. Um, we used to spend a lot more time in these lectures on this. So if you're interested in more of this, you can go back to the 2017 lecture where we cover this a lot more. Um, but for now, we're just going to show it uh, kind of like a way to cover the several chem reviews that are written on this topic within a span of about five minutes. So problem today number three, and uh, these may be uh, very easy for you, uh, ask the question, and perhaps uh, we can learn from what we already talked about at the beginning of this lecture. What happens when you take this uh, dichloro instead of the monochloro quinazoline anoxide and treat that with sodium hydroxide? somehow now you get the monochloro compound as the product. Does someone want to call this out? You have the hydroxide attack at the C on the aromatic ring, the uh, one in the middle between the two nitrogen. And then we're in a position to do something pretty much identical to what um, Simona taught us at the very beginning of the class. Yeah, because uh, you have the N plus, so it will eliminate. Yeah. Perfect. Great. How about problem of the day number four? what in the world is going on here? We treat this with sodium hydroxide and uh, somehow this thing closes up to that. Not quite sure I understand what's going on here. The NO bond here has somehow been cleaved. What's going on? Uh, 
So you could deploy that hydroxyl group and attack the alpha chloro. I'm worried about this uh, suggestion, Sung Han, because now you've made an eight membered ring. So I'm kind of confused as to how you're going to get us to the product, but I'll trust you. Uh, I'm thinking about the alpha proton you draw, maybe, uh, yeah, the proton, eh? then break the nitrogen oxygen bond. All right, you didn't let us down. That's fantastic. Brilliant. And the final problem of the day uh, is these two mechanisms where now we have this interesting uh, hydroxylamine. Uh, looks like a great precursor to a benzodiazepine. When we treat it with uh, HCl, uh, we get out the product uh, above. However, when we treat it with acetic and hydride and then ammonia, we get the product at the bottom. So this one I think is pretty easy to understand, just a simple condensation. But the, the sort of one that requires a little bit more thought is what's going on here. What might uh, I do to this thing? Yeah. What do you say? Uh, is, uh, I'm thinking of a double acetylation. That's interesting. On the amine and the hydroxyl. Okay, now, now, what do I do to that? Then you have the alpha elimination, I mean, the proton to kick out the acetate. Huh. And you have the uh, amine. And you also have ammonia condensed with the other ketone, and then it closes the ring. Awesome. Well, that's it. That's benzodiazepines, which leaves us now. Uh, roughly 20 minutes or maybe less, well, maybe for the first time we might actually end early. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, to cover a topic that we used to have an entire visiting lecture on, we used to spend a little bit more time on this starting last year is when we started on this topic. Um, and it became increasingly clear to me in speaking to former students and consulting over the years that uh, medicinal chemists spend a inordinate amount of time on a topic that is not covered in any classroom. So many former students I'll talk to, they'll go through periods of months where all they are doing is writing patents. And it's something they're not exposed to at all. So I feel like uh, on the one hand, uh, patent law is outside of the scope of a class in heterocycles. But on the other hand, since 90% of you are gonna eventually become drug hunters, and this will consume an uh, enormous amount of your time it probably would not be a hurtful thing to spend 15 minutes uh, describing this uh, uh, part of what will be probably a large portion of your future career. So the disclaimer, because uh, it could be used against me in a future court case, I do a lot of expert witness uh, stuff, is that I'm not a lawyer and uh, everything I'm uh, saying on this topic, um, view it as like, uh, you know, the Pixar version of patent law, okay? It's just uh, for fun. It's a novice telling you about chemists that are going to be going to this very important area. Uh, I am not qualified to give you any advice on legal matters, and uh, you should consult a qualified and certified patent lawyer, and nothing I say in this section should be used against me, because I don't know what I'm talking about, okay? That way, I, if I'm deposed in the future, they, they can't get me uh, saying that I was teaching them law. That's what that little disclaimer is for. All right, so what does a patent do? Well, it grants a property right, obviously, to the inventor. It's a contract, essentially, between you and the government. It lasts for 20 years. 
And uh, what is the right that you get as a consequence of getting a patent? And something I really never realized is that you, the, the, you know, the right you get is not to use your invention. How do you like that? When you get a patent, the point of the patent is you're, you have the right to tell people what they can't do. So you're getting the right to exclude others from making or offering for sale the invention, but you do not have the right to use your and commercialize your invention. Well, that seems confusing, right? I mean, but the part that's not confusing is that you can imagine if you're patenting something which is an improvement on another commercial product, it doesn't mean you can just make a you know iPhone with identical specs but a slightly different antenna and market it as your phone because you'll be infringing on a hundred other patents. So the same thing goes for uh, a chemical patent. Okay, there's important patent codes one needs to know uh, in day-to-day -day application that I'm not gonna bore you with, but they refer to the types of things, USC 101, 102, 103, and 112, which tell you about the inventions that are patentable. What can you, in what can you patent? You can't patent things that are in nature, right? So if you just say discover a natural product, but you don't know what it's used for or whatever, you can't patent a natural product, for example. You could patent a use that no one you know, foresaw. Uh, and then there's sort of the conditions for patentability. It has to be novel, right? It can't be a, an idea of a, of a compound, let's say that there's a lot of precedent already and you just pick something from literature and you say, well, you know, I'm gonna try to patent it. You, you, won't, you won't get away with that. Um, so really you want non-obviousness, right? You want a non-obvious uh, discovery. And then there's the specifications. So we'll talk about this when we talk about the sort of anatomy of a patent. Before we get into the anatomy of a patent, uh, let's look at the patent we're gonna be covering today. And it covers the synthesis of the compound shown here. So uh, does anyone have an idea of how we might be able to very rapidly Put this compound together. Any key disconnections that we can use? Can you disconnect one and two and six and seven and then just disconnect to the amino acid? That sounds that pretty way? awesome. And I guess like a halo nitro airing. Put the nitro group there where it belongs. And uh, this fragment here, so we would isolate. Here is your amino acid fragment right here. Beautiful. So that's how you would make that compound. Let's take a look at the anatomy of a patent. Uh, you've got in there your cover page, your specs, and your claims. Um, has anyone ever looked in a patent and um, as part of your research? No? Do you ever look up procedures, try to look up procedures, and you find in SciFinder gives you a hit and it's a patent and you grimace? Yeah, because you're grimacing because often those patents are written in a way as to unfortunately make it as difficult as possible to know what you're excluded from doing. So um, there are some companies that are really good at writing very nice patents that look like publications with schemes and figures and reagents and conditions, and that's great. But there are also a lot of patents that are written in such a way where everything is IUPAC name, you don't even see structures, and everything is text. So um, I think most students and practitioners, if they're just looking for a procedure, they usually try to avoid that right away. But luckily the Roche patent we're gonna talk about today is one that is a better written document that doesn't have these issues. So let's take a look at what a patent looks like. You've got this sort of cover page and on the cover page, the important thing when you enter a company will be looking at that priority date. That priority date tells you if you've been scooped or not. So there is a, you know, there are there is some nuance about this topic that we should probably get into that people often get uh, confused on in terms of, you know, did I get scooped or not? So if you if the disclosure that you made 
was um, one year or less before the effective filing date, uh, then you you it won't count as prior art. So if later on you find that someone patents something and it's three months before you, apparently the law says uh, that that um, disclosure is contemporaneous and you, you, you might be entitled to your patent. Um, the other thing that should be noted here is that uh, in your uh, patent, you've got to put background publications of what the prior art was at the time. But um, if you missed a publication and something in a, in a publication was out there showing that it was already known, your patent can be completely invalidated. Um, in, in addition, the inventor seems like a ra rather boring thing to talk about, but inventorship is not the same as authorship on a journal article. And when you're crafting a patent, if you put someone or leave someone off, if you put someone on who didn't actually do anything with regards to conception or reduction to practice, the patent could potentially be invalidated. And similarly, if you might have left off someone, it also, I've been told, could lead to, lead to invalidation of your patent. So, um, you know, patent lawyers are in some ways uh, heroic in the job they do. They can be used, of course, like everything has a dual use. Chemistry can be used for bad things and good things. The law can be used for bad things and good things. Um, if you're trying to simply break someone's alter uh, authentic patent for spurious reasons, I would say that's probably a bad uh, use of lawyer's time, although that happens all the time, particularly in the area of generics where they try to, you know, break uh, a patent. However, if you're, let's say you spent uh, five or 10 years of your life leading a program and making a legitimate invention, and then someone spuriously tries to come up and say that your patent is invalid, you can imagine that you really need a good lawyer to make sure that your innovation is protected. So I've had former students go into patent law. It can be a really fun career choice. We've talked about process, med chem, radio chem, all of these things. We haven't talked about patent law, which can be a really good career choice for uh, uh, organic chemists for which there is a, a huge market and demand out there. Let's talk about these crazy structures that you often see when you open up a patent. Uh, does anybody know what these things are called? These have a name. These are called Marcus structures, and they're named after Eugene Marcus, Marcus, who won a legal case setting the precedent for the uses of generic chemical structures to represent the general chemical space around related compounds for a patent filing. This was back in 1924. So these are now known as Marcus structures, and they should be crafted with great care. So moving on, in a patent, you will see a title here. You will see a, a description or an abstract. That is, you're starting to grow out the scope. So think of it in terms of geography. You, let's say you want to claim a certain tree in a forest. And so you say, uh, first, we're going to cover all of California. And then we start narrowing the scope. But the title of it is, you know, a tree, maybe for use of, uh, you know, being really pretty or, or generating oxygen, whatever you want to call it. But you first have to say what the field of the invention is and then start diving down deeper and deeper so people understand what it is you're actually covering. And so this is now the definition part where you define all of the pieces of the Marcus structure. What do all these R groups mean? What can they be? What are they limited to? What have we actually done? So the uh, important aspect of what becomes now the specifications are telling people what you have actually done and directing them to the fact that it is not obvious and also allowing for the practitioner to reproduce what you've done. So it's a really important point that a person of skill in the arts or, or called posita needs to be able to understand what you've done and then with reasonable not undue experimentation reproduce what you've done so if you put out a claim like the marcus structure we saw but you show no synthesis of it, any of these compounds it's unclear whether you were actually in possession of the invention that you claim to be so that's why this is included these experimental procedures are included in a patent like this similarly 
you also have to show that you knew these compounds had the use you said. So often you'll see some random uh, biological assays at the bottom that show, yes, these compounds have some uh, activity. They don't have to be potent. Look at these numbers. These numbers are not very potent uh, for, for some of these compounds, but um, you know, the more potent you can show them means that you've actually got something that's uh, you know, pretty useful. So this is probably a topic of itself, a three hour class. Finally, the most important part of the patent is not at the front, it's all the way at the back. And these are the claims. So you've got the first claim, which is the independent claim, the sort of, my tree is in California. Then you've got the, the dependent claims, which say, well, it's probably in the county of San Diego. Um, you probably want to look towards uh, Enza Borrego. You probably want to look at these coordinates nearby here. And so the dependent claims get narrower and narrower to kind of guide the uh, practitioner to what exactly specifically you are claiming. So question for you folks, if you would like to break this patent, what's something you think you could do right away to potentially break it? Deuteration. Ah, let's talk about deuteration. That's a really uh, interesting uh, point you bring up. Deuteration is a relatively new phenomenon that came out with this company called uh, Concert Pharmaceuticals. And um, Concert Pharmaceuticals made a brand by deuterating specific parts of a molecule that are known to be metabolized and in doing so, improve the half-life of a molecule. Now, if I just took any position of this molecule and just randomly deuterated it, would that be patentable, Nick? Well, presumably that would probably not be enough if it's protected by the uh, general substitute. It's not, it's not. In this patent, there's nothing with deuterium. Um, well, in that case, I guess you could um, claim that it's a different compound. You could claim it's a different compound, but uh, the problem would be a patent examiner would decline it on the basis of utility. What it's useless compared to the prior. Uh, yes, if you could show, yeah, you, you, you would have to show that it, it has a different, you know, it Aha, has a different use. A different use that is non obvious. So you would need to show, hey, we deuterated at this position, and this position was critical because cytochrome broke up the molecule. But if you deuterate it, you use a kinetic isotope effect, and now you get uh, a non obvious outcome. Now, as a consequence of people playing the deuteration game, uh, most patents these days try to cover deuteration all over the place, but those patents can still be broken because although you could claim all deuterated analogs thereof, it doesn't show the practitioner blaze marks, so to speak, if you're, if you're a patent lawyer, as to where the deuterium should be and what the utility would be. So deuterium is still a big problem for big pharma and thinking about how to carefully, you start seeing in the newer patents, people actually making some deuterium analogs to show, hey, we were in possession of the method that would allow you to do the uh, deuterium incorporation and we knew where to put it and we're covering that one too. Just like in the old days, people didn't patent different uh, enantiomers of compounds. So that was how I think Celgene actually began as a company was in making uh, an antiopuriform of, of a racemic mixture. Many companies started like that in the old days because the patent space, you know, it was not obvious that making one enantiomer would be better than another one. So uh, yeah, deuterium is a good idea. Any other ideas? Sulfur. Sulfur in place of one of these auctions, perhaps, right? Yep. Potentially, sure. But notice that they don't cover, to my knowledge in this patent or any of the dependent claims, do they cover putting nitrogens around the ring? So, you know, that might be uh, an interesting one to, uh, to potentially look at. So let's summarize this now. We've got the written descriptions. Uh, what does the inventor possess? We've got the enablements. You need to show the inventor enabled the person of skill in the art to have the benefit of that said invention and it can't involve undue experimentation. So you can't just say any arrow group here 
And then somebody spends the hard work of spending years and years to find out some really complicated and wacky arrow group that is really the key to making a drug. And then the original person comes back and says, oh, I said, I already said any arrow group, you can't do that. That is an example of what will bring you to a court case. I'm not the lawyer, but that's gonna be just decided by a jury or a judge and you can go either way. Um, so there's a question from the outside. Uh, yeah, it's about uh, agri-science and whether those things have similar patent rules in terms of extra rebate and other generics or... Yeah, agro, agro has the same uh, rules. And the extra uh, part of it... Now, we were only talking about composition of matter, right? We could have a lecture on the process patents as well. And in agrochemistry, the process patents are very, very valuable because as you can, as you can imagine, a generic medicine for a billion dollar drug where uh, the cost of goods is not that important. So you wanna get your costs low, but it doesn't need to be ridiculously low, leaves a lot of room open for a generic to come in, come up with a different process, a little bit cheaper, maybe the same cost. Uh, there's a lot of room. In the agro space, however, their chemistry is so, so difficult because of the cost of goods being so critical that often their process patents are just as useful as the composition of matter because those process patents show you how you can make it for pennies per gram. So it's often very difficult. If you talk to people in agrospace, what about your generic competition? The answer is often they don't have a generic pressure because their cost is so low already, the generic would find it very difficult to compete. It's a great question. So this is a very complicated topic. Um, I hope I gave you know a good little 10, 15 minutes so that when you join a company one day, you don't look back and say, gee, I wish we would have been exposed to this in grad school. Uh, now you've seen it. Uh, it can be a really complicated and it can be really fun in terms of you talk to some medicinal chemists, they love writing the patent because it becomes like a chess puzzle. You write your claims and you think about how do I prevent someone from beating this patent? And so for a lot of people, that is a really fun puzzle. You've discovered a drug, you're excited, you've done something great for humanity, and now you have to protect your invention. So don't look at patent as a thing to be avoided or dreaded, but rather it can be a lot of fun and a great brain teaser to protect all the hard work you put into an invention. So with that, so we when, will, yep. oh, oh yeah, sorry, I was just gonna ask, when you introduce those general substituents, all the permutations essentially must have been made to claim it in a patent, right? So if you wanted to say include the nitrogen on the ring, you'd have to make all those structures as well to claim them. Ah, you could, you could, I've seen patents where they try to say, well, we, we do exactly what I wrote in the patent where you put nitrogen everywhere. Okay. But yeah. it's a weak, it's a weak marker structure and you may not even be uh, awarded those claims by the patent uh, examiner because they will say, where are the structures? So sometimes it's awarded. Sometimes you will not get the award. The way to guarantee you get the award is to make one representative example of each of them. So you, so you might even get away without, if, if you say put X, X, X. Uh, oh yeah, of them. you will see that all the time. Oh my goodness. But technically they should, they should demand, you know, that you make the actual compounds because they, you you could that way you could just sweep what if you just replace everything with a general group and then you can just kind of claim you know a really a i agree with you space. yes i agree with you and and patent law is a you like i said you could take it you know there's reasons that there's law school you could take a whole you know if there's a patent lawyer listening to this and they're cursing me now saying oh my god you you've bastardized my field made it so simple uh, you know, I've been on a lot of depositions and ex I have experience in this area and it always surprises me what the patent office can sometimes let go. And, um, you know, this is a, a very complicated field and you're right, Nick, uh, you know, there, there, there's not an evenness of, of what you see out there because they don't have the same patent examiner for all patents. Yeah, so some enough. of the things get through and some of them do not. And also, it seems like when one is to patent a methodology, then it, it, it's always about patenting a new reagent or a new compound. Uh, it's never about, uh, you cannot really patent a condition. For example, if someone, it would not be possible to patent a cross-coupling when it was first discovered, right? You would not be able to claim the concept of using a boronic acid. And you would. I mean, Suzuki, if he tried, let's, I mean, that's a good question. If Suzuki tried to patent Suzuki coupling, 
uh, he probably could have gotten that patent. It, um, you know. But then it, all the patents I've seen are just some general structure, be a, 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 a reagent or a new drug. They claim a structure of a particular compound. They don't really claim, you know, a protocol. That's right. Methods patents are very difficult to enforce. It's why a lot of people don't patent their methods because they get very little return on investment. There are examples of where methods patents get some money, like Grubbs, the example of metathesis, his catalyst got a lot of money because I think it's a specific catalyst structure. Uh, but if you talk to people like Barry Sharpless, you know, patenting things like, uh, you know, AD and AE, we're, we're not so financially, uh, you know, if you talk to people like Barry, he'll say the best way to get people to use your method is don't patent it because you don't even want the company to be thinking, do I have to pay this person a royalty to use the reagent or the conditions? So you're likely not going to become a billionaire by patenting some organic methodology. But you probably- so if yeah. Suzuki was to patent the cross coupling it could be done actually, right? It likely could have been done, but the question would be uh, if someone came up with a different palladium catalyst that was not Tetricus, would that be the basis to invalidate or at least get around the patent? And you've seen this with metathesis too. People make different catalysts that don't fit within the scope of the claims of Grubbs patent and they're able to operate freely. So that's why methods patents are so difficult because there's always sneaky ways around them. Where there's a clever organic chemist, there's a good way to break a patent often. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, got to, we've got to close this thing, Nick. That was great. And uh, we will see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. for the final open lecture. Uh, all new, brand new on saturated heterocycles. So have a good day. We'll see you tomorrow.